Well, good morning, Rock of Roseville. My name uh, is Aaron. I'm one of the co-pastors here. And I am, uh, actually, I'm excited to speak on my first, uh, give my first Father's Day message. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, I've got a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different things swirling around in my heart um, as I was preparing and praying about, you know, what God would have me share with us as a house today. Um, so for those of you who are expecting, you know, one big, complete, nice package from beginning to end, um, sorry, but uh, something that I know that God's graced me with, and this is something that I want to um, just give you guys in terms of context for, you know, where we're going is... Um, a lot of times when you grow up in church, you just, or around church, you've been in church for a while, you learn a lot of scripture and you know a lot of things, um, but we forget really easily that all of those things that you learn actually have consequences. They have a context. So when I'm, I'm, I'm going to break down really just two scriptures, and then there's going to be a lot that comes from that. And that's because these, these scriptures that we're going to talk about, actually, they, they mean something. Do you realize that your word, even in just the sentences that God highlights to you, there's worlds that exist within those sentences. There's worlds of healing. There's worlds of breakthrough. There's worlds of repentance. There's worlds of clarity that exists even within just those couple of sentences. So uh, that's just some context for you guys in terms of there will be a little bit of scripture, lots of talking. But I'm going to pray for us because uh, even if you don't need help, I need help. So, Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for being the perfect example of what a father is. Um, and God, I just thank you today for the healing that you want to bring. God, over the fathers who have been experiencing anxiety, I release peace and I release wholeness. Not just over their minds, but over their bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was praying and thinking through what God wanted me to share, uh, to speak to the fathers of the house today, I, I just heard one phrase very clearly, and I heard the Lord say, I'm healing fathers. He said, I'm healing fathers. At which point I said, that's really nice. Do you want to give me anything else? And he just kind of left it at that. He said, I'm healing fathers. And so I was sitting with that and I was praying through it. And then uh, just earlier this week, actually, my spiritual father, Eric Waterbury, who's here today, he, he came back from a conference recently and he just sort of out of the blue mentioned, uh, hey, at that conference, I actually got healing in my knees and for some issues with some like nerve ending type stuff not without him knowing anything that the Lord was talking to me and stirring in me. So I took that as a confirmation. It's like, oh, okay, God, you're actually doing something here. We're, we're tuned into what you're saying. And, you know, most of the time, I, I think a lot of Father's Day messages are, you know, about how, like, dads, we see you, like, we see the sacrifices that you're making, like, thank you for doing all that. And yes, that's true. And, and I think God actually is inviting us as a house to take it a level deeper for ourselves. Uh, and, and I'll explain that here in a moment. But most of you dads, and as a side note really quick, um, you don't have to have your own biological children to be a father. Amen. In, in fact, in scripture, the, the measure of maturity that scripture uses, if you look at 1 John 2, John's talking to the believers and he's saying, you know, blessed are you young men, blessed are you little ones. And then he says, blessed are you fathers. And he's not, he, he can't possibly just be talking about people who've had their own biological kids because he's writing to the whole church. So I would actually pose to you that the way that the father measures maturity in the faith is actually how much we've grown towards becoming a mother or a father in the faith. So don't let your potential lack of your own biological kids, you know, don't allow the enemy to use that to somehow exclude you from what we're talking about today. Because if you're alive and you're here on the earth, 
then actually God needs the father heart to come forward in you. And the world needs the father heart to come forward in you. So with that, fathers, you would probably identify with this line of reasoning. It's this line of reasoning that gets pushed to us by the culture. And then in reality, I don't know that the church has always done a great job of dismantling it, but it's this idea of me being the father, I have to be the backstop for the family. Everybody else has permission to be in pain. Everybody else has permission to fall apart. Everybody else has permission to have problems. I'm not. Because if I do, then what's going to happen to all the rest of the people that I care about? I'm giving you at least a little bit of insight into some of my own broken ways of thinking and broken ways of reasoning. Those lies that come up. And I have to believe that that's not just me. And it's that space, it's that way of showing up to fatherhood that I believe God's actually inviting us to heal. So what I'm going to, if I'm doing my job well today, I'm actually probably going to leave you with more questions than I am answers, but I'm also hopefully going to help you reframe what success in fatherhood looks like. Because it's, it's what Jesus has even been inviting me into. I've got, I, I'm, I've not been through every stage of life with my kids. I will own that. I'm five years plus into being a father of my own biological children. So I'm not pretending to have all the answers here, but as a father who is on the journey, there are some things that God's even begun doing in my own heart that I would say, fathers, we we all need to be able to catch this. So we come to fatherhood with this broken way of thinking of, it, it, it all has to be on my shoulders. If, if I don't catch it, all of these balls are going to drop, and then basically the end of the world's going to happen. <laughs> Hyperbole is helpful for us, you know, kind of poking out what's true and what's not true. But we show up to fatherhood that way. And I was processing this and praying through this, and then um, does, does God ever ask you guys questions? Yeah. At least one of us. <laughs> um, anytime that the father asks me a question, I'm, I'm excited because that means that there's more than just one thing he wants to deposit in me. He's actually inviting me on a journey. Um, but he, he posed this question to me and it kind of rocked me and I don't have a perfect answer for it. But the question he asked me is, Aaron, if you need daily a savior who bled, what makes you believe that your family needs a father who doesn't? If you need a savior who bled, died, put all of his vulnerability out there for the world to see. Most of us dads, we're we're okay with suffering. We're okay with sacrifice, but we need to, we, we feel the need to hold all of that privately, which, as a side note, how well is that working out for you? <laughs> if that's the way you live, it's not if, but what are you addicted to? If we have daily need of a Savior who bled, what makes us believe our families need fathers who don't? And this thought that I've been working, working through, and this is what the Lord's been reframing fatherhood with me. He, it's the statement that the, the greatest gift that you can give to your family is not your own perfection. The greatest gift you can give to your family is your own healed heart. Because let's just break this down. I don't know a father alive, good, bad, or otherwise, that doesn't want to give the world 
to his children, that doesn't want to give the world to his family. That's how we're wired. But we do know stories. There are fathers who work their fingers to the bone, who sacrifice, who do all this stuff. And then they get to the end of their lives and their kids don't know them. For all the work that they've put in, their kids still have broken relationships. For all the work that they've put in, for all the sacrifices they made, for everything that they've put forward so that their kids could have a new, a new platform to step onto, we look at the state of the hearts of their family and their, it, it's in disarray. And I would propose to you that those are the fathers who lived underneath the lie that we talked about at the beginning. Those are the fathers who said, my family, I, I fail my family if I let them see that I'm in pain. I fail my family if I don't actually process stuff with them. I fail my family if they see that what I am saying yes to so that they can succeed. I'm, I fail them if they see that that costs me something. And I would just propose to you that if we look at the life of Jesus, he tells a completely different story. He tells a completely different story. Aaron, why are you talking about Jesus? Isn't it Father's Day? There's a member of the Trinity that kind of fits pretty perfectly with the whole father thing. G there's a, a scene in the Gospels where Philip, one of the disciples, comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you would just show us the Father, it's enough. Because at this point, Jesus has made all these claims about his own divinity. He's made all these claims about who he is, what he's come to do. And Philip is saying, you know what, if you could just, if you could just show us the Father, we'll be set. And Jesus' response is pretty straightforward and abrupt. And he says, Philip, have you been walking with me all this time and you don't get it. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what does that tell us about fatherhood? That actually the, the, the people who know how to be the best fathers are the ones who know how to be sons. There's a, a saying and a truth that we talk about in church where you, you can't give away what you haven't received. But so many of us get so bought into our own inadequacy when we become fathers that we immediately jump straight into, I have to, like, my value is production. We're so aware of our own inability to rise to the, ta like the, the immensity of fatherhood. We, cause we're all showing up to fatherhood with our own wounds, right? We, we show up to fatherhood knowing, you know, where fathers didn't, you know, rise to the occasion in our own lives, where we're missing things, where we have deficits, where there's pain. And we're so deathly afraid of passing those on that Rather than actually allowing the Lord to father us and get healing, we say, I've got to bottle this all up, shove it in the back, and I've got to perform. What is also true is that what you refuse to acknowledge and heal from will run your life. What you refuse to acknowledge and heal from will run your life. I, I'm, I'm blessed to ha have a very good father. And some of his story, let me, if you need a concrete example of what I'm talking about, let me tell you a little bit about my father, Tom. My dad grew up in a family of six kids. He was one of two boys. And my grandpa on my dad's side was a rageaholic. He knew how to work really hard. He was an immigrant from Italy. 
Everybody, like if you've spent any time with anybody who's immigrated from another country, you know that if they know how to do one thing, they know how to work their fingers to the bone to provide for their family. And my grandpa knew how to do that. But if I can look at my own family history and see how that man likely operated, he likely operated underneath the lie that we talked about at the beginning again, right? My family doesn't need my heart. My family doesn't need my availability. They need me to provide for them and give them opportunities I never had. And if I did that, they don't have the right to ask anything else of me. Which led to the situation, and my dad will freely admit this, like my grandpa was a rageaholic. My dad has memories of abuse happening in the house, just different things, and it was not good. Furthermore, uh, my grandfather passed away when my dad was 11 years old. I'm going to get, I'm, I'm just going to give you the disclaimer right now. I'm going to get emotional while I'm talking about this. So uh, we, not only does my dad, like from 11 on, not really have a picture of like what a father is or what a father does, but the, the brief snapshot that he has of what fathers are like is that they're angry and abusive men. How many of you guys know my dad? Several of you do. Um, any of you who have met know my dad would know like, if you haven't heard this before, it would probably surprise you that this was his story because my dad is nothing like that. Because my dad got some of what I'm talking about. He, he knew, like, I, I don't have an example of what this looks like. I don't know how to do this. But what I can give my kids is my own healed heart. There's a world of pain that I never had to touch because my dad put in years of work. And I want to, again, this is about giving you guys a concrete example. Because we can talk all day about concepts, but this is just is the story that's touched my life. Um, I... As I stepped into ministry and started praying for people, I started noticing that I have, I have a grace for inner healing. I have a grace for emotions, like seeing where the Lord wants to meet people in that and seeing breakthrough there. Um, and in the, the arrogance of my younger years, I was like, man, God's doing all this new stuff with me and like all of this. And then uh, my, my dad's a big reader. So one, one day I'm just going through some of his books in the garage because he's got tubs and tubs of them. And at this point, I've learned enough about sort of the inner healing movement that I've learned about Elijah House. How many of you guys are OGs and you know, know about Elijah House? Um, the Sanfords, they, they were some of the first people, um, really as far as I know ever, to pioneer this idea that like, hey, God may actually want to heal your heart from past wounds and that can affect how you show up now. Um, and so I'm looking through and I see all these books by the Sanfords and I'm like, dad, what are these doing here? Uh, and then he comes back and he says, like, oh, I was actually, I actually got trained by Elijah House to do inner healing ministry back in, like, the, the mid to late 80s. And I was like, wow. So much of us, uh, this is the other side of the coin that we don't talk about. We, many of us have an understanding and a concept for generational curses we're very aware of the pain that our, our parents and our fathers have caused us, places where they've fallen short, but we don't spend hardly any time talking about. Scripture says, you know, I will visit the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, but he would visit the blessing, he would visit the righteousness to the thousandth generation. Wherever, yes, generational curses, generational trauma, generational pain, that's real, but no two that the work that you put in to heal, you're actually creating space for God to bless thousands of generations that come from you. 
So what I want to say to you fathers too is that as hard as it is to do the work to heal in your own heart, it's not just about you and it's not just even about your immediate kids and it's not just about the people directly around you that you're fathering, that you're actually partnering with the Lord to bring healing and wholeness into a generational line that's gonna bear fruit hundreds of years after you die. And this is part of what it means to be a father. Most of us who have our own biological kids can identify with, there's this, there, there's this thing that gets flipped in you the moment you hold your first kid, where all of a sudden you, you just get at a deeper level, my life is really not about me anymore. And again, coming back to God wants to heal fathers. He wants to heal the hearts of fathers. Like we, we have this concept and this understanding that the way that you are inside, who you are in your internal world is how you show up to everybody else, right? So why would we think that as fathers that we, we can just stuff what's going on on the inside? We can take the pain, we can take the confusion, we can take all the stuff that we're walking through and we can just stuff it down and that's not somehow going to affect these people that we're giving everything to love. And to, let, let me say this as well. So many of us, again, we, we show up to fatherhood, we, we knock on that doorstep and we cross over that threshold and we're so aware of our own shortcomings, we're so aware of what we didn't have and what we're basically in ways that we're lacking showing up to that, that call. And we immediately interpret that as, I have to prove to God that he didn't make a mistake by calling me to this. And let me ask you this question. How, how many of us have gotten really any further in loving Jesus and in loving people and in the kingdom of God by just white knuckling and trying harder? So why would we assume that we can somehow father the people around us, father our own kids by just white knuckling our own pain, white knuckling our own traumas, white knuckling our own issues. And here's where this is actually really good news. This means that what you've been carrying, what you've, the, the stuff that you've held and refused to talk to anybody about because you're afraid of what is on the other side of you coming forward. Not, it's not even just that there's no shame in having that, it's actually that that's the part that God wants to get at the most. Yeah. That the Father actually wants to father you so that you can father. Ephesians 3, it also says, it's, this is Ephesians 3, verse 14, for those of you who want to jot this down. Paul's about to launch into another prayer, but he leaves us this little one-liner. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family on heaven and on earth is named. What does that mean? That means... The only reason we know what a father is and what a father looks like and how a father acts is because God is who he is. So it would make sense then that if we want to father well, that we need to probably stop striving to prove to God that he didn't make a mistake by calling us to be a father and say, God, would you show me 
how to actually do this. One more experience that I want to talk about here. And again, if I'm doing my job correctly, I'm leaving you guys probably with more questions than answers, and I'm giving you things to ponder and think about, which is good. I do believe God's going to set some people free here this morning just as we pray. But also, I, I believe that God's setting many of us on a journey. Because healing, as much as I love when it happens in a moment, a lot of healing is a process. It's something that you have to commit to. It's messy. You don't know up from down half the time. You're having to like reorganize stuff in your heart and in your life. But again, this is what the Lord's been heading up fatherhood under for me. It's that the, the greatest gift I can give my family is my own healed heart. Which means whatever mess is created, whatever mess we step into and me figuring things out and me healing, that is actually worth it more than me pretending I have it all together. Because here's the other thing. I, I'm, I'm happy to be in the stage right now where my kids think I'm Superman. Like, most of us can also trace and remember a moment where a switch got flipped and we're like, oh, dad isn't perfect. So here's the deal. That moment is coming regardless of how hard you try to run from it, how hard you try to hide your own imperfections, that moment is coming. So if you can get ahead of it and show your kids what it is to live life in such a way that says, I'm not perfect, but I know a God who is, and I know a father who can love me when I don't know how to love you. That's powerful, and that's where transformation happens. That's where generational curses get broken. This is, again, another experience that I had that God's just been, it, it, it was a quick moment, but it's just stuck with me and I've just been pondering it because it's reframed a lot of things for me. I was uh, given my wife a break one day. Um, how many of you guys, you know, you're either a parent of young kids or you walk through that stage and you know there's some days where the wife gives you the look and you're like, kids, for everybody's safety, we're all going to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those days and we needed to get some shopping done anyway, so I threw the kids in the car and went to Sam's Club and just had them, had them in the cart and I'm just walking around and I'm, I'm really not doing anything profound or spiritual. I'm just talking with them, I'm engaging with them, I'm tickling them, like I'm just, I'm just doing dad stuff. And as I'm walking through, like I can feel all these eyes on me. I can just like, normally I'm, I'm wonderfully oblivious to stuff like that. Um, but in this moment, I could just feel like, I could feel all these people looking at me as I'm just engaging with my kids. And in that, in that same split second, I just, the presence of God just falls on me and I can just feel his love. I can feel his goodness. I can feel just how near he is. And what he speaks to my heart in that moment is, Aaron, all you need to do is show up. We so want the world for our kids. We so want the world for the people that God has called us to father that we somehow get it conflated in our hearts that like what they're, what they're expecting of us is our greatest desire for them. So it's like if we didn't go to college and we want to be able to create that opportunity for them, we, we have this lie in the back of our heads that they're expecting, their measure of feeling loved by us is whether or not we can make that happen for them. But what God's communicating in this moment to me is like, really, Aaron, your kids just want you to show up. They just want you to be there and heck, they just want to know that you like them. How many of us grew up with fathers who we knew loved us because of what they did, but by the way they acted towards us, we didn't actually know whether they liked us or not. 
And the other thing that was communicated to me in this moment, as somebody who does ministry, like we, we desire, and, and all of us really, we desire impact. We want our lives and the influence that God gives us to matter. We want to see the world different as a result of how we've lived our lives. And so many times we, we, again, immediately jump to, that means I have to do the biggest thing that I can think of and anything less is somehow failure. But what God's communicating to me through this moment where I'm just like the presence of God is there and I'm just loving my kids well, he said, Aaron, like just you fathering your kids and loving your kids out in public like this is shifting the atmosphere in the store. There's a line that says we will spend most of our lives trying to wipe the face of our fathers off the face of God. I would also pose to you, fathers, that just your simple acts of loving your kids well, just your simple acts of loving your wife well, and for those of you who don't have your own biological kids, just your simple acts of showing up for your spiritual sons and daughters. Those create doorways, windows into the heart of Father God for people who will otherwise never reach out to him. So fathers, the call is that God wants to heal you. And it's up to you, it's up to us, whether or not we let him. And so many of, so many of us, we, we show up again to fatherhood scared because there's a little boy, there's a young man on the inside of us who didn't receive a lot, who was hurt, who was abused, who was left alone. And we're, we're so deathly afraid of doing that to these kids and to these spiritual sons and daughters that we love so much that we actually begin to orient our internal world around as long as I, I just can't do that. The problem with that way of thinking is, is if you orient your life around just I, what I don't want to be, you will never reach the fullness of what God has actually called you to be and to do. However, if you say, I want the wholeness and the love that exists inside of Jesus, I want the wholeness and the love that exists inside of Father God, I want that in me so that I can give it away. Not only will you, you not perpetuate the brokenness that has touched your own life, but you will see transformation beyond what you could have ever thought or dreamed. And this is what the Father has called us to. To do that, we have to be sons. So I'm going to have a stand. And ushers, if you could get ready to pass out the communion elements. Scripture, when talking about communion, talking about the Lord's Supper, gives us this snapshot and basically this instruction that says, when, when you show up to partake of communion, examine yourself. Because there's, there's something about this act of communion, this act of taking the bread and taking the cup, I don't think we understand or discern even half of the power that's there in doing this in obedience to what Jesus has asked us to do. But as the elements are getting passed out, I'm just going to say a brief prayer and then I'm just going to give us a few 
minutes here of silence and reflection just to say, you know, Holy Spirit, is there anything in me that you need to deal with before we jump into communion? And fathers, for many of you, this might be breaking agreement with the lie that it's, it's all on me. For many of you, it might be you need to actually take that first step of healing by even visualizing in your own heart, like taking the stuff that you've been carrying for some of you since you were young and just actually releasing that to Jesus. I'm going to pray. We're going to have a few minutes here to just allow the Lord to bring up whatever he needs to bring up before we take communion. So, Father... We thank you that you've given us communion. And Jesus, we just ask that you would reveal what needs to be revealed right now so that we can come to the table with a clean conscience. So Jesus, we thank you for your broken body that made a way for us to be whole. We thank you for showing us the way that a father sacrifices for the people that he loves. And we remember your broken body as we take the bread today. In Jesus' name. Jesus, we thank you for your shed blood. Your blood that doesn't just cover over sin. Your blood that doesn't just cover over our shortcomings. But your blood that actually eradicates it. Your blood that actually makes us clean as if we had never done those things before. So Jesus, I, I even pray especially for our fathers today, for those of us who are carrying heavy burdens that we need to begin the process of healing and letting go. I thank you that your shed blood is more than enough. <coughs> and Father, for all of us, we thank you for your blood that makes us clean. In Jesus' name. I want us to take just a few moments to pray over, pray over the fathers in the house today. So if you are a father, be that a biological father or a spiritual father or adoptive. Thank you. Thank you. 
if you are any of those things, can you please raise your hand? Because we want as a family and as a church body to put hands on you. So keep your hand lifted. Everybody, I want you to take a look around. Put some hands on some shoulders. Oftentimes the the first step to healing is forgiveness. Be that forgiving your father or forgiving yourself for where you haven't been perfect. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the grace and the power to forgive. Father, even right now, we forgive and release our earthly fathers for where they weren't there, for where they didn't show up, for where they caused pain. We forgive and release them for where they didn't do the work and it left stuff undone for us to take up. But God, we hand them over to you and we choose to forgive them, release them, and bless them. And Father, where we have fallen short, and we have chosen to hold against ourselves those things which you say you have forgotten and you do not hold against us. Father, we repent, Holy Spirit, for trying to take your job. And we thank you, we choose to receive your forgiveness. And we just declare even over our own hearts, I forgive you and I release you. So Father, right now in Jesus' name, I thank you, God. I just see a picture of boats setting out from a dock. I thank you for the journey that has begun for the hearts of many men here today. And Father, I thank you that you're also, even as you're beginning the work of healing hearts, that you're also healing bodies in the room. Lord, I thank you for um, just right now that you would touch the bodies of fathers in the room. Lord, that where there's um, anxiety and constriction in the chest and inability to breathe, that you break that thing in Jesus' name. Father, where there's um, fathers who are actually carrying in their bodies the physical manifestation of what they've been doing in their hearts, just like pain in their backs and in their shoulders because of burdens that they have refused to let go of. God, that you would release a sign to them by healing their physical bodies even today and every other thing that you want to heal, God. We just declare your word that you are healing fathers. You are healing fathers and you are healing fathers. So God, I speak a blessing over every man here today. I speak a blessing over every father. And I just say again, that you would heal their hearts, God. Heal our hearts, God. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.